Hello and uh, welcome everyone watching to this international discussion forum on the very urgent topic of what are the risks of the West's China strategy. Today is Wednesday, June the 7th, 2023. My name is Stefan Ossenkopp. I will be the moderator today and I'm joining you currently from Berlin in Germany. Uh, we had five speakers scheduled today, but one of them had to cancel a few hours ago because of some unforeseen family matters, but I will introduce the speakers individually before they uh, come to the virtual podium. The order will be Mrs. Zeppler Rouge, Mr. Zhang, Mr. Döring, and Mr. Liu. Uh, presentations will be around 15 minutes, maybe one or two minutes longer, and afterwards we will have up to 60 minutes of discussion uh, about questions from you, the audience. So your questions can be entered into the questions and answers chat room below. It's uh, called Q&A or in German, I think it's called F and A. Uh, you should have uh, concise uh, questions and also state your name and affiliation. Uh, before we begin, I would like to just briefly, maybe one minute, say something that um, many people have responded to our invitation and said that it's really urgent that we have this discussion about the risks that come with the steps that the West is taking, so-called decoupling or de-risking, as Ms. von der Leyen has said, and label everything that has to do with China as a security matter. Now, speaking here from Germany, uh, the capital of Germany, I can say that just in the last few days, a lot has been done to discredit China even further, especially Chinese scientists and students working and studying in Germany. The head of the German Domestic Intelligence Service the so-called BND, has alleged that 40,000 Chinese students in Germany could potentially be working as spies for the Chinese government. Furthermore, Chinese, uh, I'm sorry, German authorities have announced that cooperation in the scientific and high-tech sectors of the economy will be closely monitored in the future, as if to place all Chinese citizens working in these fields in Germany under general suspicion. I think this serves as a pretext to poison the atmosphere um, ahead of the visit of the Chinese Prime Minister Li Chiang to Germany for the seventh German-Chinese intergovernmental consultations on June the 20th. Likewise, the G7 at their meeting in Hiroshima recently has also vowed to monitor investments by G7 countries in China. The EU has announced sanctions against Chinese companies who allegedly helped Russia evade sanctions. And German ministries under Green Party ministers Baerbock and Habeck have already drafted new China strategies that would move away from the notion of partner and much more strongly emphasize rivalry with China. And although these strategies have not yet been uh, officially published, the general direction is already clear. What risks can be derived from the West's new China strategies? risks for China, for the West itself, for the world community as a whole? Are we heading for a disastrous miscalculation that could severely disrupt trade and development? Will this add fuel to an already very dangerous potential for confrontation? We will hear from our four very knowledgeable individuals and I'm happy to introduce as our first speaker, Helga zeppler rouche the founder and chairwoman of the International Schiller Institute, an independent think tank, devoted to the building of a just economic order and a respectful dialogue among cultures. Mrs. zeppler is also a senior fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at Renmin University in China, a very prolific writer of articles, policy studies, and a well-known regular contributor to global media, including Chinese news media such as The Point or Dialogue. Her speech is called De-Risking, Then Rather More Trade with China. Please, the floor is yours. Well, I say, first of all, good day and hello to all of you. And I will speak about this ominous new word, uh, de-risking, which I think was recently invented uh, in English. Um, well, this seminar is actually meant to sound the alarm, to urgently review the present economic policy and to fundamentally rethink what are the existential economic, political, social, and security interests of Germany 
and the other European nations. What is at stake is much more than the economic relation between Europe and China. It is the existence of Germany as an industrial state. And by implication, because of the size of the German economy of all of Europe. It is also the question of war and peace. Because in the final analysis, there is no significant difference between the coupling from China, which is being pushed by the United States and Great Britain, and the risking, which is a terrible Orwellian double speak, which is being promoted by the EU, the German government, the G7, recently they unified on that formulation. But it would basically lead to the same result. The effort by the so-called North, the US, Britain, EU, and for some strange reason, Japan belongs to that North, to not only go against China, but against the BRICS, which uh, so far more than 30 countries, by far more than 30 countries, have applied for membership, and therefore de facto going against the entire global South. Recently, the former president of Malaysia, Dr. Mahathir, made the assessment that the threatening separation of the world into two separate economic blocks would with certainty increase the already horrific security crisis and almost certainly lead to a new world war, World War III. And I fundamentally agree with that view. For the German economy, the so-called de-risking, which is really a code word for geopolitical confrontation, would mean the final blow. The sanction policy against Russia has not so much hurt Russia, which essentially replaced the brands, the German brands, VW, Conti, Miele, etc., with the Chinese brands, Sherry, Great Wall Motors, Geely, Xiaomi, etc. Due to the cut of cheap Russian gas, a result of both the sanctions against Russia and the sabotage of Nord Stream pipelines, and the amazing lack of interest by the German government to investigate the background of this crime, the German industry has been deprived of the decade-long subsidies in the billions of euros with cheap Russian energy and is paying now almost three times as much for expensive US LNG. The US Inflation Reduction Act is another element of creating an unfriendly environment for German industry in Germany compared to the United States. According to Siegfried Ruswurm, president of the BDI, the German uh, Industrial Association, already 16% of German companies are actively involved to relocate to other countries, mainly the United States and China. And another 30% are thinking concretely about doing so as well. That means 46% and potentially more are considering to leave half of the German industry, half. That is the beginning of a total deindustrialization of Germany. Furthermore, as a result of the decade-long prioritization of low energy flux dense investments, so-called green technologies, the logo made in Germany is no longer a point of attraction of excellence or even the, and even the German photovoltaic industry long heralded as potential, a potential world champion has since replaced by, by China, has been replaced by China. 2022, the inflation rate was at 7.9%. Real wages collapsed for the third time in a row by circa 4%. And since the beginning of the year, Germany is officially in a recession, which is, among other factors, the result of a collapsing consumption and the reduction in buying power of the population. 
Food sales shrank in April by 13.4%. Furniture and construction material minus 10.9%. Deutsche Bank just issued a report that a default wave is imminent in the US and the corporate sector, but also in European high yield bonds. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. The recent insolvencies of the US banks and Swiss Credit Suisse and the vacillation of the central banks between quantitative easing and quantitative tightening are markers <clears throat> of a pending systemic crisis, which was unresolved in 2008 of the floating exchange rate system, which has amassed a two quadrillion dollar speculative bubble, mostly in derivatives, which is untenable in principle. For Germany and other European nations to demand to disengage from China, no matter what language, is, what language one uses for that, it is suicidal. Especially all such schemes completely ignore the reality that the world is presently undergoing tectonic changes, which require that each nation reflects on its true self-interest in this rapidly changing world. First, for some time, but especially <clears throat> since President Xi Jinping initiated <clears throat> the Belt and Road Initiative 10 years ago, <clears throat> this largest infrastructure and development project in the history of mankind has completely transformed the dynamic in the world. 150 nations and 30 large international organizations are cooperating with the Belt and Road Initiative, an enormous number of projects, development corridors, industrial parks, fast speed railways, highways, ports, energy and agricultural projects, et cetera, et cetera, have given these developing countries for the first time the chance to overcome poverty and underdevelopment. Contrary to the mainstream media stories about the so-called debt traps, these countries learned to regard China as a reliable friend, which means it's serious with its win-win approach. While the transatlantic system is teetering on the verge of disintegration, the growth figures in China and Asia in general were only slightly reduced due to the pandemic, but still reflecting the fact that the Chinese economy remains the true growth engine of the world economy. Second, instead of taking the rise of China as an opportunity to take up China's offers to cooperate in the development of the Belt and Road Initiative as a way to transform the countries of the global south, the United States, Great Britain, and increasingly the EU started to characterize China no longer as a partner, but more and more as a competitor and rival with consequent policies of attempting to start with China's economic growth. <clears throat> Along with the attempt to prevent the emergence of a multipolar world, the dollar was what was generally perceived uh, weaponized. What we are seeing as a result is a wide ranging process of de-dollarization of trade in, natural, in national currencies among many countries of the global south <clears throat> and the effort to add a new international currency separate from the dollar. The main aim of these efforts is to create an independent means for credit creation for investment in development, which are presently impossible under the regime of the World Bank <clears throat> and the IMF conditionalities. President Lula of Brazil heralded the New Development Bank headquartered in Shanghai as the coming great bank of the global south. Obviously, the 150 countries working with the BRI, the BRICS Plus, and many other organizations of the global south do represent the vast majority of the human population. These countries have revived the spirit of Bandung of the non-aligned movement and are totally committed to overcome any remnants of the colonial system and realize their innate right to become 
fully developed nations, which can provide the chance for their populations to realize their potential as human beings. In light of these epochal developments, it lies in the natural self-interest of Germany and the other European nations to cooperate not only with China, but with this new emerging system and overcome block thinking, which only can lead to a general destruction. The Schiller Institute published in 2014, in the wake of President Xi's announcement of the new Silk Road, our comprehensive study, the, no, the new Silk Road becomes the word land bridge, which is a blueprint for the infrastructural integration of our planet through bridges and tunnels between the continents and the general infrastructural development of the landlocked areas through so-called development corridors. This will eventually eliminate the location disadvantages of the landlocked areas of the world and bring development into all countries of the earth. Several of such projects are being realized by China in the meantime, such as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or the Bandung-Jakarta high-speed rail line, many uh, projects like the Djibouti-Ethiopia rail line and many others. But it is also clear that there is plenty of room and actually the need for cooperation of all nations if the most urgent development requirements are supposed to be accomplished. For Germany and other European nations, a positive future without cooperation with the global South is impossible. So it is not just the relation with China which must be redefined, but it is the cooperation with the emerging new paradigm in international relations. It is urgent that we find back the way to peace without which we risk the annihilation of our species. And even if it appears to be difficult, given the present strategic situation, the more resolute the European nations reduce their risk by working and trading more with China, that is actually the greatest favor it can do to themselves and their American ally. Thank you. I'm sorry, can I be heard now? Okay. Thank you very much. Now, next, we will um, hear a speech by Professor Zhang Jun. Zhang Jun is the Dean of the School of Economics at Fudan University in Shanghai. He is the founding director of the China Center for Economic Studies and a member of the Special Advisory Committee uh, to the Shanghai Municipal Government. Professor Zhang has authored or edited numerous books and journal articles on economic issues and he's a respected commentator on Chinese and international media. So we welcome you to this podium and looking forward to your remarks, Professor Zhang. I think you have to unmute yourself, yes. All right, cool. Yeah. Right. Um... You know, for some technical reason, you know, I, you know, I have been rejected. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wasn't online until you know, for, in the middle of the speech, uh, of previous speaker. You know, I, I couldn't uh, uh, actually capture, you know, another half of her speech, but uh, it looks like, I, you know, for. There is a very, uh, you know, uh, I, I think it's a very uh, special moment, uh, you know, for the for the West because they they, they try to uh, isolate, you know, for uh, China for uh, whatever reason. Uh, but I, th I think so in principle and in theory, you know, for China definitely can, you know, sustain. Is economic development uh, by by himself because given the sheer size of uh, 
of domestic market uh, and its capacity, you know, in the manufacturing uh, and also uh, in the uh, technological, uh, you know, uh, capability. So, um, but but uh, but I think so for uh, for the economy like uh, like China, uh, you know, of course it is best for China to uh, continue its, uh, you know, uh, international trade with the rest of the economy. Because uh, even China now is the second only uh, to the US in terms of the, uh, you know, the size of the economy. But I think China is still, uh, you know, a middle income country. So which means that, you know, China needs uh, uh, exports and import uh, with the, uh, the rest of the economy, uh, rest of the global economy. So, um, so I don't think China gonna, as a as a you know for uh, uh, retaliate, uh, you know measures. China uh, does not really want to isolate himself. You know, I, uh, you know, still there is a lot more that it can be, uh, you know, for improved. Uh, both in the uh, cooperation with uh, the advanced economies, and also, uh, also I think in through the Chinese investment into other uh, developing and, and and emerging market economies. So that's that's the uh, I think so the point uh, made by the Chinese leaders uh, over the past ten years. You know. Um, uh, for the the West, you know, the West strategies to de-risk, uh, you know, approach with China, you know, I I I think, I uh, you know, for when we when we're talking about when we're talking about the mutual independent or the mutual uh, interdependence, I uh, you know, I think this is something that uh, both uh, countries. I uh, can easily implement such strategy uh, by reducing the you know re, uh, dependence with uh, dependence on others. You know, if you look at if you look at the uh, the global supply chain in terms of the uh, technological supply chain, I I think China going to definitely still uh, still rely uh, very much on the uh, you know. Uh, technological supply supply chain, you know, which I think is uh, many uh, manipulated by several uh, invested economists, uh, especially uh, by the U.S. But is this, but if you look at the other way, you know, if, uh, I think it's Western economists also, you know, depend a lot more with the supply chain, uh, you know, of China. You know, you know, I I think it's maybe. This is something that uh, uh, asymmetric, uh, you know, for uh, where I would I would say asymmetric tension between China and the and the West. You know, for I, I you know, as economists, I, I think that the Western economists may think that it's much easier for them, you know, to find an alternative, you know, to the supply chain of China. But uh, but China would. Would find no option, uh, but but you know develop such uh, you know supply of technology by by himself. You know this is perhaps the I uh, I think so the the point uh, made clear by the you know Western uh, you know narrative. Uh, even I uh, you know I think that the you know uh, business community may not really follow you know their way, but. But this is actually the very strong, uh, you know, uh, prevalent uh, narrative, you know, in the West right now. I, so, uh, so many times I was, you know, asked by, uh, you know, foreign friends about about this issue. You know, I, you know, I always reply by saying that, you know, I, yes, this is true that uh, for, for instance, for the U.S., for for Germany, you know, it could be. Uh, easier uh, for them to find out the alternative, even, uh, you know, they're still going to pay, uh, you know, pretty high costs, you know, having the uh, substitute for, 
you know Chinese supply of of uh, intermediate and 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 the, the you know capital equipment or, you know something like that. I uh, but still I I think this is you know impose a pretty high cost you know for Western uh, economies because you you know moving away from the supply chain of China I you know I onto some of the alternatives in in other places you know I would would definitely get it have for the uh, much higher you know transformation or transaction costs uh but for China you know I by you know either forced or, or deliberate you know uh reduction uh you know in the dependence of the supply chain of the high tech or some of the core technologies uh, supplied by several you know advanced economies I uh, would mean that China has no option but but you know has to supply by themselves so which could take a much longer period of time you know for China to to catch up you know so this is you know may not be a a bad news I uh, I in terms of uh, uh you know the you know the transformation uh you know of of the uh uh gross model you know for China you know who used to uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, be successful uh, over the past decade or two, uh, but now, you know, you know, we 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 also need to de-risk, you know, for de-risk in terms of the, re you know, uh, great reduction uh, in dependence of the uh, supply of technology by us, uh, by America or, or or several other countries. So um, so so China, you know, as I say. I uh, would definitely going to concentrate on the uh, some of the top uh, you know supplies of technologies, uh, especially for the uh, you know for technologies that they could have for the bottleneck effect on the Chinese manufacturing upgrading. I uh, so uh, so I think that we we probably should look look you know look in the future you know if, if you look into the future you know what. Uh, what is the what what is the long run you know uh, impact you know of a such kind of the Western de-risk strategies on on the global economy and and the Chinese economy uh, in particular, uh, you know I think it may uh, you know it may be uh, like this that China going to benefit a lot more you know for, uh, in the long run uh, because I uh, you know this is going to really you know, this is strategy going to really incentivize, you know, uh, China to speed up the upgrading process and, and put much more investment into the uh, the core technologies so that they could uh, realize the self supply. Uh, but for Western economies, I, I think in the long run, they're probably going to lose uh, Chinese market, uh, you know, for, which perhaps is a very detrimental I, you know, to the, I, uh, to the economies of themselves. Okay, moderate. Thank you very much. Uh, we will follow up on, on some of the uh, issues that you have brought up. Uh, of course, um, farsightedness is a quality of the Chinese uh, current um, direction, and I think especially in Germany, it's more short-sightedness. Um, so I would like to bring up our third speaker, Ole Döring, professor at Foreign Language Studies College of Hunan Normal University. And he has also um, been a private lecturer for the philosophy of culture at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. For over 25 years, he's been teaching and organizing collaborative research between Europe and China. His academic publications include many books, essays, journal articles in German and English. The title of his speech is called On Risk, Strategy and Relations, Reclaim a Human Perspective in Global Affairs, Some Philosophical Remarks. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Ossenkorp, your chair. Distinguished colleagues, can you hear me well? Good. Greetings to everyone listening, watching, and participating in this forum all over the world. I'm speaking to you from Changsha in Hunan, South China. 
And it's my honor to contribute to this discussion and a pleasure to engage among such eminent scholars today. This pleasure would be even more profound if it weren't for this sad occasion. Let me start with a few comments regarding the title of today's forum. I'm not sure if the wording of the title is, uh, duly expresses how deeply serious, unprecedented, unfortunate, and entirely unnecessary this confrontation actually is. Can we call the erratic and reactionary behavior of the US and her allies regarding China a strategy? Driven by base instincts, it appears as a reactionary rather than as a result of responsible planning. Fueled by opportunism, greed or fear, it remains erratic. Now, strategies can predict and be predicted, but volatility must be checked. After 1989, transatlantic allies have entered a mind zone called the end of history, in which constructs more and more have taken the lead over real experience in matters of orientation. Mental constructs are powerful, driving our imaginations. They are difficult to distinguish from concepts, but their distinction is crucial. This discussion dates back to antiquity when philosophers such as Plato or Zhuangzi discussed the difference between truth, similarity, and pretense, and the dangers from not being able to identify which is which. Basically, constructs merely need to be plausible to some in order to be effective, not true. They make us see the world as a game board where we can control and manipulate the operations. Concepts must work in real practice. They depend on real knowledge, real learning, and real experience with real people and in the real world. There are heuristics to unlearn and new understandings to be acquired. Cheating and even honest errors can lead to harm and even disaster under conditions of our increased complexities in our world. Obviously, understanding involves care, patience, and best use of all relevant resources over time. We know since Kant that concepts without experience are empty, experience without concepts uh, are blind. But we also know um, that we can make them work together meaningfully when we engage in the intelligent operations of reason, that is, making proper connections and making relations appropriate. Without roots and branches in real life, what looks like concepts are simply constructs, namely soft technologies without human value and purpose. They are wishful thinking at best and lunacies under most conditions. Debates over constructs such as systems or normative identities, when they describe human entities as mere objects, change the game we are playing, making it idle when we take the assumption of control for granted. In such a manner, contextual concepts such, such as race, gender, nation, and even culture have been deprived of their real meaning and become weaponized, as if they were technical implements in a warfare. Moral concepts, on the other hand, such as dignity, have already been ridiculed and reduced to utilitarian calculus, for example, and especially in bioethics and by transhumanism. Now the ethics regarding life and big data processing are integrated into the even greater context of language and AI supported gadgets with chat GPT and the metaverse campaigns as icons of our immaturity. The Tower of Babel is crumbling once again. With it comes the loss of a perspective of balance and proportion, while the vain builders are trapped in the self-centered refusal to adapt to the changes of history and find humane responses. Propelled by a mythical framing of AI, our cultural regresses uh, and disintegrates uh, even faster than before. The primary outcome of this de development is disintegration. The secondary is alienation, ultimately hostility and war. The overwhelming evidence indicating a cause of corruption instead of healthy path is the continued and enlarging process of disintegration from the communal micro levels 
in many societies to diminishing confidence in politics in the first place. There is no strategy at work here, and it is not likely to emerge when continuing along the way of modeling through with no cultural reference such as humanism and enlightenment. The West needs fresh input of realism and pragmatism in order to regain a humanistic balance. Such input can come from peoples and cultures who are eager to learn and willing and able to share. Obviously, this makes China the number one choice as an ally, especially in questions of global stability, healthy economy, ecology, and a sense of humanism. We cannot talk about strategy where not even the tactics align in making sense, because they only serve to weaken all nations, countries, societies involved, including humanity for the short-sighted benefit of only a few. It is telling that the proposed measures against China are always cloaked in incoherent accusations and false descriptions of a nuanced reality. However, more important than analysis of failure, we are advised to overcome the blaming game and rehabilitate an attitude of respectful collaboration. Second and very much shorter about the title, risk means the probability of an unwanted outcome. When we consider the kind of outcome presently in reach, describing the pattern of behavior in terms of risks is an euphemism. We are witnessing real danger, not just the probability of harm. We are experiencing real harm. The mess of international affairs has gained such a magnitude that reason demands hope for the resolve itself to go on. But where can such hope come from? Within the cross cultures, learning, planning, and discussing make sense only as something that we do together. In particular, it helps us not to be led astray by ignorance and deception. Let's look ahead. What do we stand for when we look forward in human relations? It depends on our position and attention. By entering into dialogue, we stand for the firm conviction that good China relations represent a value in themselves for everyone. At the same time, they come, uh, they form the rich basis for the creation of value. Who are we when we meet, for example, as Germans and Chinese? Do I stand here before you as a representative of a system, as some people would have it? Do I stand for rivalry? Am I supplying, uh, am I simply a human being, or can I even, quoting Confucius, offer friendship when coming from afar in the spirit of a learning community connected by the joy of being well met? What is this actually supposed to be? A system? As individual actors of societies, we are not technical objects, nor are we abstract formulas. We are no constructs. We live together in the common house of our world. We have interests that at the same time connect us with each other and can also lead to disputes. Our house is one world. Walls have been torn down, pathways opened. The human family now clearly has only one roof and one fundament to share, to care for and to make better. Some find it difficult to get used to this situation. There are always challenges in any change. Forming a household is an ambitious endeavor. There is much room for the surprising, the unplanable, the salt of life in the crooked timber of humanity, which no system can ever grasp. There is little to fear, but a lot to be managed. Fear and suspicion are the worst advisors among new acquaintances, unless the option of friendship has been tried and ruled out. In the case of China, Europe has never tested and tried it seriously on the level of equality, not even after Leibniz or Matteo Ricci and a few others first opened promising entry points. Now we have the chance, and honestly, no other option but to try it seriously. There are different values and convictions based on experience, some of which we share, some of which help us to address irritations with patience and confidence. We benefit from wise housekeeping. Housekeeping, that's Greek for economics. Since China's full membership in all organs and institutions of the United Nations, we explicitly share this 
legal, ethical, and moral foundations. Science and economics form living interrelationships uh, constantly in flux to ensure stability and prosperity. Who would have thought that as being realistic? 51 years ago, when our diplomatic relations were reestablished, for some years now, we have been in the process of repositioning ourselves, not least due to the opportunities and challenges of the new Silk Road. The structures and lines along which we orient ourselves and work together are becoming ever finer. Stereotype thinking or iterating past cliches does not do justice to this fabric. Sclerotic attitudes contradict the need to account for change. Nothing is new about this. We can make better use of our change management knowledge under conditions of global modernity. Fortunately, we have in fact already grown so deep and close together that an unprecedented mix has emerged. In some areas, we are on equal footing. In some fields, Germany is doing very well. In others, China is now setting the standards. You can't just order decoupling and possibly at the same time get worked up about alleged authoritarianism. On the contrary, we have to take a look, a new look, differentiate, adjust, always under the assumption that we are inseparably part of a greater whole. There are much better concepts than the clumsy metaphor of coupling to capture the sense of connectivity for the Commonwealth of Nations. Decoupling betrays a plumber's mindset and way and may just as well be flushed down to the drain. In order to understand what we should pay attention to, we can confidently trust Confucius. He says in chapter 13, sentence three, the first task of the state is to ensure that things are called by the right names, Zhong Ming. Our relationship now are also in need of finer and more precise description. Language belongs to the realm of soft technology. Terms that denote machines or ideologies when talking about human and social practice should now be replaced by those that map our social nature and allow real relationships to be better pursued. In his famous peace speech <clears throat> delivered exactly 60 years ago on June 10, 1963, John F. Kennedy laid out his formula for peace with, at that time, the Soviet Union. The new Sino-German diplomatic relations were made 10 years later under the historic conditions of the notion that not everything can be about peace, but without peace, there can be nothing at all. Kennedy's peace speech and the policy of rapprochement developed by Willy Brandt and Egon Barr within the center of the European conflict zone highlight how the current approach to Russia and the Ukraine war needs as dramatic a reorientation as much as a solid Chinese engagement base. How long will Europe afford its ignorance and arrogance in ignoring China's outstretched hands and open arms while redefining itself ever more as a US vessel? Just look at what's written in the Washington Post today about the uh, Nord Stream pipeline. In reality, we are in a good, very good position if we care to respect the facts. Germany owes much of its prosperity in recent decades to close cooperation with China. By adopting uh, much that was German, China has been able to develop successfully. This gain is now flowing as added value into more and more opportunities for win-win-win. It should not hurt Germany to be somewhat infected by China's dynamism and innovative power. At the same time, we have a lot of experience, especially in the areas of society, education, and health, which we are happy to share with the Chinese. If we look beneath the thin but often shrill layer of public excitement, we see Germany's and China's innovation cultures share a conservative, entrepreneurial, and fair-minded basic attitude. Publicly, this insight is mainly taken up in the business press, not the mainstream or the so-called social media, but even the leading media occasionally bring sober and competent comp contributions, such as the board and management chairman of eight leading German companies in November of last year, 2022. They say, I quote, more independence is not to be achieved by setting oneself apart, but 
by increasing growth momentum and regaining Euro Europe's technological leadership. The strengthening of Europe and Europe and Germany must go hand in hand with an interest-based approach to China that is not only related to the economy and technology development, but also to other fields such as culture, science, or youth exchange. Therefore, Germany, Europe, and China must open new opportunities for cooperation, jointly define projects that are in both of our interests. The sustainable development of the economy and society is certainly the central field of this, end of quote. Indeed, Germany, Europe, and China can jointly define projects that are in the interests of all of us. The sustainable development of economy and society is not just a slogan. We need the new opportunities for cooperation and have the task of creating them anew under the conditions of our time. The reference to our youth points to an area where everyone can benefit and where so much needs to be done. However, if we use the wrong terms to describe ourselves and each other, we run a high risk, we get stuck in the past, we misjudge each other and create avoidable misunderstandings. What's more, the self-fulfilling prophecy of wrong terms narrows the horizon of thought and sets erroneous incentives of action. Above all, it is always harmful to cause fear. What we don't understand about each other, we can differentiate, sort out, patiently negotiate, and link with what already connects us. Those who describe human relationships as systems cut into their own flesh. Finally, the best that a wise and cultivated politics can achieve is to enable living balance. The Chinese word ping does not mean a fixed state, but a quality that we must always continue to work on. So it's not so much like the English peace. It's like keeping a balance while riding a bicycle. Peace under heaven, in that sense, means living good, uh, uh, means uh, having a good order uh, for the free play of the diversity of value generating forces. And this is what is written as the ultimate lesson in the classic, the great learning, the Dashue. Another canonical text that connects China's ancient world with our world today, if people would just read it. This is also a gentle hint at China's strategy, and here the term strategy really applies, China's strategy to tell China's story to the world. Doing this right is a challenge and a huge opportunity, not only for China. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, before we come to the speaker, Professor Liu, I would like to say that um, you can enter your questions into the Q&A uh, button below. We have more than um, 60 listeners. And please prioritize your questions to uh, Professor Zhang Jun because he will be online for another half hour. So after the... Um, Last speaker, we will go directly into question and answers. I'll please prioritize your questions to Professor Zhang. Uh, the last speaker is uh, Professor Charles Liu, a senior fellow at the Taihe Institute, an independent think tank based in Beijing, China, with a mission of facilitating mutual appreciation between civilizations and promoting global peace and development. Professor Liu is an economist and investor and has founded the Impact Asia Innovation Technology Fund. He has been very active in media worldwide, including uh, CNBC and Bloomberg. So we are very eager to hear your contribution. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I shouldn't be addressed as a professor because I'm really not an academician. Uh, I worked pretty much as an investor in China for the last 35 years, uh, running private equity funds, and venture capital funds and so on. So I saw China's growth. I was part of it and I participated in it. In some instances, paid tuition, but uh, basically had seen what had happened to China in the last 30, 35 years. What happened in China, I would call, is not just China, it's the growth of Asia, the swing from the West to the East. 
the growth of Asia, the rise of Asia had China at its core. And you have also all the Southeast Asian countries participating in this growth, growth pattern in this process. What we had in China was the building of the most sophisticated and the most modern supply chain and the logistics system that exists in the world today. Why? Because it was new. Unlike what supply chains look like in the U US today and infrastructure looks like in the US today, or when I visit Germany even, how roads are in lack of repair. So what we had in China was the building of a new infrastructure, the building of, as, as Deng Xiaoping once said, quoting a party secretary of a small village, to get wealthy, you have to build a road first. That was basically a capturing of a sense of needing to build infrastructure, and they did. And this infrastructure spreads throughout China, especially initially along the coast, and then tied into Southeast Asia. So now we have basically a supply chain that covers most of Southeast Asia. As one of the previous speakers said, it's intermediary goods which are being transported or shipped all over the place. In fact, chips, if they're made in the US, will have to be put into products shipped to Asia because it, the final products may be produced in Asia. So I think what we have in terms of risk, if we break this supply chain or put disruption into the supply chain, we're going against the fundamentals of economics, which is seeking greater efficiency. What we have in China today is structural competitive advantage. Number one, the economies of scale coming from the market size. Number two is the supply chain and the modern infrastructure which goes with it. And number three, China's established trading pattern now being the number one trading partner of over 120 countries. So with these competitive advantage, what do we have? We were able to keep inflation low until the war in Europe and the United States. We were able to supply manufactured products to all countries all over the world. Here's a side comment from an African friend, senior African official who said, you have not seen the development in Africa in the last 10 years. It's been absolutely phenomenal. And we have to thank Shenzhen. I said, thank Shenzhen. That's really very strange. Why? He said, it is because the Shenzhen's innovation, technology development, and supply chain that produce 45 Euro smartphones. With smartphones, people with without bank accounts can now have financial transactions. With smartphones, you have rapid flow of information, educational material, and social gathering as well. So it's quite interesting that this supply chain in China and this logistics system and this manufacturing master house has been able to actually help Europe and the US lower its costs and also help developing countries develop more rapidly. For Europe, I'm sorry to say the last couple of years has been very distressing for me. I have many, many friends in Europe in business, as business partners and so on and so forth. What I've seen is standing, sitting on a high horse, preaching to the Chinese, about what is politically correct. What China wants is not preaching to anyone about political correctness. What China wants is peace and stability so that everybody can develop, everybody can benefit. What China wants is exactly what they did, mediating between Saudi Arabia and Iran, leading to thereafter addressing the Yemen crisis and the problems with Syria. 
So this, I think it's beginning to be recognized by the global south. People are beginning to say no from the global south to America when they're being pushed to take sides against China. What we have now is the GCC countries, especially also after the Arab League summit last year, is now taking a much more positive stance toward collaborating with China, building peace, building stability, and then more trade, more mutual support. This is what's happening there. And what, what else we saw last month was the summit of Central Asian countries, five plus one with China, also seeking the same development, also seeking the same message of collaboration and mutual benefit and mutual respect. I, being the last speaker, I'm very happy that I haven't, I needn't go over a lot of things in detail because they've been fully covered by the previous speakers. What risk there are, I see for Europeans. Number one, the risk of becoming a totally a vassal of the Americans because you are now de dependent on America for capital, for the dollar, and for energy. That's the risk. The second risk for Europe is you miss the train. You miss the boat of the rise of Asia, the rise of the Belt Road, Belt and Road Initiative, which is now bringing faster growth and contributions to global economy from China, ASEAN countries, the Middle East, and even Central Asia, and North Africa, and maybe even Southern African countries. You will miss that train. If you continue to think in terms of the old days, colonial mentality or the Cold War mentality, I'm sorry to put it so bluntly, but that's what I found among many Europeans, even unfortunately, especially many Germans are now preaching to the Chinese about, especially some senior officials, about what is politically correct, what China must do, what China needs to do to be politically correct. I'm sorry, China does not see political correctness in your, in your way or in your same standards. China seeks peace, China seeks stability, China seeks mutual respect, and China seeks collaboration for everybody's benefit. And this is now being recognized by the Global South. Many media, not, not, not media, many uh, uh, surveys have shown China standing in the Global South among the population has been rising even though it's been falling within, within the United States, given the machinations and the, how it's attacking the Chinese as if we're evil devils. And this is happening, especially among the Anglo-Saxon, UK and US. Unfortunately, some, some parts of Europe, uh, it's very easy for populism to follow the same path. Unfortunately, that's already beginning to also influence a lot of the local Europeans. But I think with the COVID crisis over, with the, the possibility of traveling again and better communication and better meeting of people and uh, getting to know each other once again, uh, this, will, this will go on a better path. But then the war is, of course, uh, going to be there to impact on this because many Europeans and many Chinese who want to go to Europe are now having trouble with flights because they cannot fly over Russia. So now flights are very few and far in between and very complicated. But um, I hope things get better very, very soon and very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liu. I would like to now open the discussion. And I think the first thing would be to give uh, Professor Zhang the opportunity to um, 
make a comment or remark on what he has heard so far by uh, Helga zeppler rouge by uh, Mr. Döring and Mr. Liu. I think you have to unmute your microphone first. Okay. Right. Um, so I, you know, I have to leave uh, in about 20 minutes. So I have uh, uh, this opportunity uh, to make comments on the uh, previous speakers. Right? And I think that, you know, if, uh, think about China's rise as a, as a phenomenon, you know, if, um, I, it's really kind of, uh, you know, if, uh, inevitable, uh, you know, process of um, uh, restructuring the Chinese economy in a way that, it, you know, is very similar uh, to that of Japan, you know, you know, so Asia Tigers, you know, because uh, we, we really share the same strategies, in, especially uh, in the 1990s when uh, China uh, decided to, I, I think, give up the, uh, you know, having the chemical uh, strategies on the top priority uh, and then move on to the Expo, you know, Expo promotion strategy uh, and try to, um, you know, make more uh, foreign exchange uh, so that, you know, uh, China can input a lot more equipment and capital goods, you know, from the advanced economies. Uh, this strategy, uh, you know, tended to be quite successful, uh, where simply because I think that strategy uh, is a kind of a institution saving strategy, uh, because it doesn't really need um, you know more sophisticated institutions. I you know it doesn't it doesn't need the whole institution to change uh, completely. I uh, you know because uh, export pro processing zone, uh, you know, and, and the industrial policy like that you know can work better. Uh, even there is no substantial you know for a change of the you know economic system. You know, it could definitely going to uh, save a lot of institutions. So this is a kind of the uh, a quite minimize you know for a quality of institution strategy. You know, uh, and it used to work uh, for Japan, uh, uh, and you know also for uh, you know Korea and, and and you know other tigers. So um, so I think that you know no country. Especially if you look at if you look at you know all, all the other countries independent from uh, uh, from their uh, you know for, I would say the uh, colonial time of uh, uh, you know uh, for for many many years uh, you know and once the you know for any become independent you know they always promise I mean the the government the government always promised to the public that you know we're gonna. I find out to the effective strategy to industrialize the whole economy. I, I, I you know, and I and I look around in all, all the all the all the cases, you know, after the World War II, you know, I think they all they all, you know, have the same um, propensity to, you know, uh, to choose the uh, input substitution strategy. Because I think that could help us a lot, uh, you know, to honor the promises, you know, to the public. Uh, but 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 the problem, I think, the great problem with the input substitution strategy is that you know, uh, you know, once they implement such kind of uh, strategy for industrialized economy, you know, they're going to really need uh, more capital to put into the economy, right, which. Which is definitely going to, uh, you know, conflict with the, uh, you know, with with the fundamental shortage of uh, of the capital. So, uh, so it's very very difficult, very hard for them, you know, to begin with the uh, industries, you know, that need more capital uh, put into the economy. So either they could borrow a lot more, which is going to create the the debt issue. Uh, you know, uh, later on, or, you know, they probably should uh, uh, get some of, uh, I, I would say, um, 
you know, of, uh, uh, distortions in the policies so that they could uh, seize more surplus from, you know, from majority of people uh, who live in the countryside, you know, uh, by uh, something we call the, you know, scissors, uh, uh, scissors gap. So, um, so, so such strategy cannot sustain, uh, you know, in the long run, because uh, facing the great shortage of foreign exchange, you know, so that they cannot really upgrade their technology, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so that that is all, perhaps all the all the uh, reason uh, behind the, uh, you know, the big shift of the strategy for for this for these countries, you know. Uh, to uh, you know export promotion strategy. So, so I think you know such a strategy, uh, you know, renamed by the Chinese government in the in the later 1980s as a as a kind of strategy, something we call the uh, you know the um, um, you know something we call in Chinese we call Wai Xiang Xing Jingji you know, is a kind of uh, you know uh, outward looking. Uh, you know, economic development strategy, uh, which called for the opening, uh, you know, for, uh, I mean, I, I mean, they call for more foreign direct investment, you know, uh, and, uh, and, you know, path the, uh, I, the, you know, even in the very limited, you know, space, uh, you know, they, they're going to have uh, uh, industrialized, uh, a zoom or, or something they call the export processing zoom you know so that they could they could you know uh, make the uh, policies more uh, you know preferential you know to the foreign direct investment so so you know there is a lot more uh, investment coming from uh, from from uh, from uh, you know western economies uh, so that 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 is actually the I think the beginning uh, of the process that for China to catching up, you know, with the with the vast economies because that that is very I I would say, uh, you know, very institutional saving uh, process, and also they're going to open this opportunity for uh, Chinese local government, you know, uh, to move. Uh, uh, very fast toward the, uh, you know, uh, streamline their, uh, you know, governance so that they could make the foreign direct investment coming uh, to the locality. Uh, you know, this is actually also the source of the uh, greater reduction of the bureaucracy, you know, in the local government. So the local government can, uh, can play a more important role you know, in the process of economic development and industrializing, uh, you know, Chinese economy. Uh, but now, you know, I think 30 years later, uh, I now with with the great advancement in the technology and also the capacity to manufacture, you know, uh, in the very long list of the global supply chain, you know, China can, you know, in almost every manufacturing sector, China can export the technological sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, products, uh, which is largely a, a a shift of the export promotion strategy, you know, to uh, something you know we call perhaps the uh, the you know outward looking you know input substitution strategy you know is this the input substitution strategy but it is still very much you know uh, outward looking uh, you know it can it can export uh, more technological soft scale product so uh, so I don't think China gonna like it should you know, close the economies and shut down uh, you know the economy. Uh, from the rest of the uh, global trading system, you know, China has been that you know a great beneficiary from the global trading system, and China wanted to keep that system working, uh, and it would contribute a lot more, you know, to the uh, free trade 
uh, you know, uh, system in the in the global economy. But now, but now, you know, we, we're really facing uh, the challenges, you know, from uh, some of the threat from the advanced economies in terms of uh, uh, cutting off the, you know, uh, supply chain of the high tech, you know, uh, products or something like that. That would have put push China, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, into the process of speeding up, speed up the uh, technological innovation uh, so that China could command the high, you know, uh, in the near future uh, for some of the Pacific industry. I, so I, so I, I'm very um, optimistic at this moment uh, because I, I didn't see uh, any kind of, uh, you know, um, things that are going to really uh, stop in China from, uh, you know, developing further. I, I think that the uh, moving, you know, along the technological ladder uh, is an inevitable process for China, uh, given its uh, status quo capacity of manufacturing and technological development. You know, uh, uh, plus you know the huge amount of the human capital accumulated over the past forty years. You know, so um, so so that's that. I think you know that's the uh, the point that met by most of the Chinese economists. You know, I, I you know we we don't deny that uh, you know we have some challenges. In the in the short term, but uh, uh, but I think if you look at if you look at the 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 fundamentals of the Chinese economy, because uh, it's highly marketized, you know, I, and and as the market players, uh, you know, are looking for any kind of uh, you know alternative to try to uh, you know survive uh, in in such kind of uh, a globally unfriendly environment. So I'm, so I, I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, we'll, you know, maybe ten years later, you know, I think uh, I, we we would have more evidence uh, to support the will of most most of the Chinese economists' hopes at this moment, and uh, believe that the China can, I, uh, you know, successfully. I climb up to the top of the uh, supply chain uh, so that, uh, you know, uh, China perhaps can, uh, ahead of the most of the West, you know, Western economies, uh, substantially, you know, reduce the you know, dependence on the supply of some of the particular key manufacturer, uh, key technologies. Uh, which is currently manif I mean, manipulated by the U.S. and the other uh, you know, major economies. Uh, Professor Zhang, can I, um, if you have another five minutes or three minutes, uh, direct one question that have, has just come in by Ulf Sandmark in Sweden. He says, uh, Professor Zhang, we have seen the smartphones creating a technological leapfrogging of development in especially Africa. What do you think about the Chinese magnetic levitated train of 600 kilometers per hour as a source for another leapfrogging of development and economic integration? Well, I think, it is, you know, this is definitely, I uh, characterize these, some of the advantages that China enjoy over the past 20 years, you know, in developing the, uh, you know, the, I, I would say the infrastructure, especially the transportation system, uh, with uh, smart technology. So, you know, actually, yesterday uh, for the first time, I, you know, I took on the uh, the, the latest version of uh, high speed train, which we call the smart high speed train, uh, from Beijing to uh, to Hebei province to Shijiazhuang, the capital of Hebei province. Uh, that's the first time that that I I had a such kind of experience, which is really amazing, you know. Um, um, you know, I think that that is 
uh, a kind of the uh, you know potential that it could be highly exploited by the uh, you know uh, by the way that the China uh, you know uh, developing its its uh, capability in uh, you know uh, mass construction or capital construction. Uh, which is really fundamental to the economic development. And I think China can uh, export such kind of technology, I, you know, for, as you mentioned, and, uh, you know, also a part, a large part of uh, China's foreign, uh, the outbound investment, you know, is a, is an investment which is related, highly related to the, you know, to the infrastructure construction. I, uh, you know, I think if you look at most of the advanced, most of the developing economies today, you know, the very big bottleneck is actually the great shortages, you know, uh, of the capacity to expand their, you know, infrastructure network, uh, including the, uh, you know, the high speed rail, or, or rail and, and also uh, other transportation means, you know, I, I, and China, you know, has been leading in that way. You know, if, uh, uh, it would be a great uh, opportunity for China to, uh, you know, uh, cooperate with more developing economies. Uh, I think that this is one of the ideas that for the, um, you know, Barrow Initiative, you know, because you know, we we really can, um, you know, help a lot of uh, economies, uh, you know, in Asia country or in Africa or, uh, you know, other developing high or uh, high performing economies. Uh, so this is, this is, you know, for a, a great thing, I think, for both China and, and the other economies, you know. For, so if you look at the, uh, what has China done over the past 10 years, I, in you know, in terms of outbound, uh, you know, foreign investment from China, you know, I think most of the investment really gone to, you know, uh, the infrastructure. You know, if you look at what happened in Africa, what happened in, uh, in in Middle East, you know, in South in South Europe, you know, they all they all, I, uh, I think it's the infrastructure based investment. Uh, you know, it's not a kind of the investment. Uh, that they try to, uh, you know, squeeze out to the local, you know, manufacturer or local uh, job jobs. You know, is actually created a lot more jobs for them. You know, because this is something they desperately needed, and also this is something that China can uh, can help. You know, help out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess that your time is now limited. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you very much for joining us with your valuable insights. See you at the next occasion. See you now. And if uh, Helga Zipler Rouge, I would like to ask her for uh, her comments on what she has heard from the panel so far. I, I think that uh, I can only hope that we can <clears throat> distribute this uh, event to as many people in Europe afterwards as possible, because what Mr. Liu said is so true, you know, the high horse. I mean, I find the present uh, political establishment in Europe arrogant and stupid. I hate to say it so bluntly because, you know, I think the famous statement by Joseph Borrell that the EU is a beautiful garden and the rest is a jungle and one has to make sure that the jungle doesn't come inside the garden that is so typical for um, the kind of thinking. And the G7 at the Hiroshima meeting, I think there were some articles in the British media uh, basically saying, oh, you know, we are doing well with the confrontation with Russia and China, uh, but, you know, we urgently need to talk to the leaders of the global south as if they just discovered that the vast majority of the world is in the global south. And, you know, I think that right now, you know, I would hope that the German and French and Italian and other industries wake up to the fact 
that their existence is at stake. We have a bankruptcy wave in Germany, which is unbelievable. Uh, I mentioned in my initial remarks that almost half of all German firms are planning to leave Germany because the conditions no longer exist. So we are really looking at an existential question. And the best thing which can happen, you know, is that the countries of the global south make their voice more heard. And, you know, and I have been advertising that a lot. We have to have a complete change in perception because otherwise, and I agree with uh, Professor Shang, you know, one has reason to be optimistic about the future of China because China has proven a, an incredible innovation power and resilience against attacks. So I'm not worried about China, but I'm extremely worried about Europe. If we do not get our act together, I think Europe will be a, a relic on the sidelines of history and you can study uh, Germany and, and other European countries in the museums soon of the global south as a civilization which didn't make it. I, I know this sounds hard, but I, I'm really very, very concerned that we get a way of cooperation and stop this you know, confrontation, which can only lead to the disaster for all of us. So let me direct the question to Professor, no, to Charles Liu. I'm sorry, I'm, I have this professor in my mind now stuck. But this comes from um, Liliana Gorini in Milan, Italy, and uh, she refers to an article that Professor Fabio Massimo Parenti wrote some days ago in uh, Global Times on the high risks of the Italian economy if the government of Georgia Meloni accepts the pressure from the US to cancel the memorandum between Italy and China on the Belt and Road Initiative signed in 2019 which is very important for the Italian economy. What is the view of Professor Liu on this memorandum? I think uh, it comes back on a macro basis to what I was saying before. As we just heard uh, from the previous speaker, that uh, Europe is really in trouble. Deindustrialization is taking place. It's not just cheap energy from Russia, but Gas is also a natural, uh, it's also a industrial input. It's a very important industrial input for chemicals. So what is happening, it's not just Italy, but it's not just Germany, but the rest of uh, Europe really should be concerned about the deindustrialization of Europe. And if Italy moves away from the Belt and Road, I think uh, it's a signal that it wants to join the US in punishing China, in other words, and leave not only the mass market of China, but also the Asian supply chain, which is now, I think the most advanced supply chain in the world today. Uh, there may be technical advantages of the US in terms of a number of technologies like chips in particular, or ASML in the Netherlands and so on. But supply chain is a complete supply chain. These technical uh, superiority in pieces of the supply chain will not do it. So I think if Italy decides it wants to pull out of the Belt and Road, uh, it's really a slap on the face on China, which is using the Belt and Road Initiative to build infrastructure uh, for countries along the, Belt, the Silk Road line. And if Italy wants to move out, it'd be a purely political slap in the face on China because it doesn't benefit Italy a tiny bit in terms of the economy, in terms of business, in terms of trade. Thank you very much. Um... I would like, I would actually um, give Professor Döring the opportunity to respond to some of the elements of the speeches that he has heard so far. I'm sure some, he has something to say. Oh, thank you very much. There's so very much to say, and I heard so many very interesting insights, and it's very 
difficult if not to say impossible to really um to, to respond to to all of them um but what i i want to pick up on is the um the notion that uh Hagazab larouche has has just just mentioned that europe is in danger of becoming a relict and um just want to reverse the perspective here um if this is not in the interest of china and china has expressly said that many times and demanded that europe will really uh not for for reasons of well of of europe's interest but for reasons of china's and the world's interest uh to to not to waste all the, the valuable um things we have to offer in terms of culture and economy so i think this is this is extremely important that this is uh, something that is not just in the European interest or in the German interest, but we have to think about it globally. And this might be the real crux of the matter that we have forgotten what it means to be European in a global world. And um, um, uh, let, let me let me refer to, to the, the issue of, of foreign investment uh, for to make it very uh, very concrete. We are usually talking about um, foreign investment in terms of hard capital influx and talking about infrastructure building and financial markets and, and these things but what is going a little bit unnoticed is an area where i believe there could be a huge added value for for all sides on all parts on the economic and the cultural and the political and the social levels and that is the investment in the area of tourism um because this this is an important issue not because china is an interesting tourism um destination uh but because um this also indicates an area where China really has to still learn a lot and develop a lot in many areas, starting from the still existing administrative and bureaucratic problems uh, in managing uh, such local initiatives and local uh, businesses that try to do it right. There are many, many obstacles. And I'm, I'm, I'm here in Changsha in the Runan province involved in, in um, advising some of these green and health-based tourism uh, development projects and i can see from the inside that there is a lot that can be done in ways of improvement uh, of course this cannot happen if the the european market is not uh, well strong and interested there must be the demand on the european side but we don't know about what we can actually benefit from going to china as tourists is not just to watch Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism are great new industrial projects. This is, of course, very important. But we have totally ignored the fact that China is a new green powerhouse. It's a, a powerhouse for building uh, urbanized health visions and uh, real experiments and successful experiments, because they are always trying to learn and adapt in the area of um, modern city building. And when we talk about cities in Germany, we still believe that, that this has to do with, you know, putting bricks everywhere. But uh, here we can see, uh, when I'm looking out the window, Changsha is an extremely green and open city that has been a kind of masterpiece in urban development. And this also extends to the countryside, where, where many projects uh, invite foreign investment. But there are very few interfaces and there's a little knowledge. But the most important thing is that when I'm mentioning that uh, we can benefit from this new motto or the slogan to tell the China story from the fact that China has not been doing very well itself in this regard. Um, I'm teaching myself students here at this Huna Shifan last year who, who want to, to translate basic information for tourists who want to become tourist guide or uh, even teachers for tourists, experts. And they are operating on a very, very uh, basic level of both language and cultural knowledge. So this is an area where actually a lot can be accomplished. And once the capacities for the soft skill development in the area, what I would call cultural diplomacy, just to indicate the ambitious and also forward-looking character of these kind of industries that are coming, then we can imagine how new spheres and new 
opportunities for collaboration on the ground for meeting of people of all age groups and all professions in China and of course in Europe and all over the world that could, could be a model for many other places. There is such a vast potential for exponential growth and this will be sustainable if it's done well. So this is just to indicate that there are opportunities that we have not even begun to tap into. Um, and I feel very much encouraged just to, to, to finish this part of the, the this train of, of, of thought has been very much encouraged by the recent developments uh, in the Chinese leadership's uh, uh, public statements about the importance of history, of philosophy, of uh, understanding and trying to rejuvenate the, the um, incorporation of classical and historical knowledge and skills. And everyone is aware that the methodology for doing that is not very much advanced. This has to do with the ways in which China's education system has been modernized according especially to, uh, to American models in the last 30 or 40 years. And it also indicates that there is a felt and an objective need for a holistic approach to science and education which still people in, in uh, continental Europe and some institutions there which still harbor this knowledge. So there is there are some born allies, I think, for Chinese strategy here as well on our side. So let's not forget upon Europe, but let's encourage the Chinese side to really invest also in these roots, not look too much only at the, well, the top strata, because they are not top. Usually, at least not what I far. I agree with Mega Zeppler Rouge on that as well. Our leadership is not a leadership at all. Um, they're a disaster. So we need responsible and capable people. We have them, but not on that level. So let's find a way to connect these people between China and the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. And before I direct the next question to Ms. Zeppler Rouge, it's also about the BRI. I would like to say that yesterday I talked to um, a, a manager in the automotive industry and he had he was in China for many times and he had worked on his CEO telling him how China is and so forth for five years uh, uh, but only when he the CEO finally uh, came to China with him his his eyes explode uh, opened his mind exploded he was completely uh, blown away and now he's come back and said, nothing that I was told about China is true. It's completely different. And of course, these complete transformations, that's, I think, that we're looking for. This is just an individual one, but he is already planning a trip and organizing more CEOs to go to China in October. Now, the question that has come in is from a, a party called the Workers and Family Business Party uh, of Switzerland, and it's... Um, about the Belt and Road Agreement that Switzerland has canceled and Germany, I think, has never has never um, signed one. Uh, and the person wants to ask, is this um, because of the political climate created by NATO and the USA? What can we in Germany and Switzerland do to stop this, apart from spreading the idea of friendship and cooperation with China? Well, I think we need an urgent mobilization of everybody, but especially the small and medium industries, the larger corporations, and, you know, basically, you know, everybody, mayors, elected officials, trade unionists, um, you know, just everybody, because if this present policy is continued, we are looking at the complete deindustrialization of Europe. And what does it mean, for example, you know, if half of the German firms go to some other country? Well, that means that you know the living standard will collapse, you will have social chaos. Uh, you know, the the poor, the people at the lower end of income, they will be the ones who will have to pay the price. But even the people who are now the war party, which is essentially the Green Party, uh, they will lose their comfortable uh, comfort zone and, and the whole country will into, go into chaos. Naturally, 
you know, you can't separate that from the war danger because the problem right now is that both the campaign to demonize Russia, um, which has been going on since a, a very long time and the war did not start on 24 February 22, it started a long time before that, but also the demonization of China comes from the geopolitical view on the world. Uh, that is the idea that, you know, you have in this case an unipolar world, which has to be maintained even so it has long disappeared. There is already a multipolar world. But the geopolitical uh, idea that you have the interest of one nation or a group of nations, and that has to be defended against another group of nations. And that is a, a zero-sum game thinking. It's a lose-lose way of thinking. And it is completely contrary to the human nature. And I think what China is offering is a win-win strategy, which is much more in cohesion with the real laws of the universe. For example, the great thinker of the 15th century, Nicholas of Kuss, who was the inventor of modern science in Europe and the you know, inventor of the sovereign nation state idea, he basically already then had the idea that harmony in the macrocosm, you can only have if all microcosms develop and that each microcosm takes it as its self-interest to develop the other microcosm and vice versa, and that that is the basis of harmony. And that is an idea which is very similar to the Confucian idea of the development of all harmony in the family leads to harmony in the nation and harmony in the nations leads to the harmony of the world. So we have to really get off this idea because you know the, the idea that you have to have a um, geopolitical world outlook is closely associated with the idea of empire, with the idea that you have a small oligarchy, a privileged class, which has to keep the masses uh, backward to keep their privileges. We have to have educated state citizens. Uh, in China, uh, you have the what they call whole process democracy, which is a different form of democracy. And China is extremely emphatic to say that the Western model of democracy is not the only model you can have. And I think what we are lacking in Europe, in Germany, emphatically so, is educated state citizens who identify with the welfare of the state. What has happened in the West is that the individualism has gone haywire. You know, I mean, that's a big difference between Asia and Europe, that in Europe, European history, uh, the idea of the individual has had a much stronger emphasis, but it has gone haywire. You know, and now you have a sit situation where everything is allowed. The more crazy an idea somebody has, the more publicity he gets. And, you know, this, this has, has led to the potential self-destruction of our state. Look at what happens with drug legalization, the rate of suicides in the United States. In, in the United States, you have now every 14 hours a mass shooting by which four or more people are killed. They only qualify as a mass shooting when it's four people killed every 14, 14 hours. Now, you know, and that is the result of this. I mean, this requires a longer discussion, obviously. But I think we have to educate people who come back to the best traditions of Europe, China and all of Asia. They are celebrating and cultivating their 5,000 year histories, or sometimes it's not 5,000, but thousands of years of history. And they, you know, put their perspective for the future on the basis of studying and, and, and understanding the greatest periods of their own history. And we in Europe are not doing that any longer. When, when you ask people, do you know anything about uh, classical music or the uh, ideas of Leibniz, they think it's a cookie, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it, we have reached the 25% oh, of the uh, fourth grade school children in Germany cannot properly read. Can you imagine that? 
the highest number of patents comes from where? Not from Germany, it comes from China. So there is a lot we have to remedy, but you know, my, my short answer, which is obviously not so short, is we have to mobilize the population in depth because our existence is at stake and we should rally around the idea of joining hands with China, doing what Leibniz had proposed, that the two most advanced uh, civilizations on the planet, European, uh, European civilization and Chinese civilization, should reach out and touch each other and develop the rest of the world together. And I think that's what we have to do. Mr. Döring, do you want to respond directly? I see your hand is up. Yes, I would like to thank you. I would like to um, to um, um, set a slightly different note, perhaps to the same sentiment. Uh, but I think the question I would like to answer in the way that it, 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 it's really about agency, what we can do as European citizens. And um, I think there are two things. The first thing is to reclaim political agency. The parties have hijacked political agency. Uh, it's totally, especially as far as German constitution is concerned, it, what they, the kind of political power that they have acquired over the last decades is not constitutional. And I will not, I will not explain that in detail. I think you can just read what's in the constitution in Germany <clears throat> and what the po political parties are doing. This is not a natural law. This is a political process. And one of the issues we, we cannot just say that well, um, we should help people to be more, more politicized and we should make it easier for them to understand. No, we should explain that democracy of the European sort, and especially of the German kind, comes along with individual responsibility. It comes along with the credit that every human being is endowed with at, uh, with at birth. And this is a burden. We have to earn this privilege. This is part of our constitutional culture. And we have never in our history, at least not since the 1970s, really a, a invested in political education that makes um, young Germans good political citizens in any, any way, so that they, they, they might be, be able to engage properly in uh, political questions. We have delegated conveniently to the parties and they have taken advantage. That was a kind of um, fool's game that we have done for decades now. So we can change that. It's not a natural law that these political parties can have any existence or must have anything to say. Uh, so we can do that. There are many ways to do that. The second thing is my personal answer to many of these issues is cancel and ignore the social media, the so-called social media. They are an ignition um, hub for, for, for uh, all sorts of animosity, um, misunderstanding, uh, all the bad things that, that, that human character will show when it's, well, not <laughs> forced to show itself in the protection of anonymity. Democracy requires to show your face. And if we have the means to hide, then we are not uh, enabled to, uh, uh, to behave as mature citizens with responsibility. So if we either ignore and counsel or very radically reform the, um, the public discourse, in the way that it goes back to the basic rules of decency and democratic culture. And I've, I fear that there will be no future for European democracy. Then that, that this, this might give rise to those or might support those people who say that human, uh, that, that European democracy might have been a good idea uh, for the ancient Greeks and the way they did it, by the way, they did not actually <laughs> elect their, their, their um, leaders. Uh, um, this is an interesting um, side to remark, uh, but that there are other political models that are more suited for human conditions. I would not subscribe to such a view, but I would emphasize that democracy comes with a high burden, a high cost, and we have ignored this burden, this responsibility, um, at the at the price of the what what we see now 
in terms of the total corruption of political culture. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a question directly to uh, Mr. Liu, um, which is concerning the role of the private sector, but of course, bringing in much, much more. It says that if the private sector can make a profit, it is interested in cooperation and does not need political tensions. Therefore, as many companies as possible must be shown concrete prospects for win-win situations. It is important that the Chinese side brings concrete requirements and topics for economic and scientific cooperation to Europe. My question, what sources can Mr. Liu recommend for this? Where can we find information on this? <laughs> That's very difficult to answer because different sectors in the economy are totally different. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure, it is mostly state-owned enterprises which are undertaking the major, uh, the major projects along the Belt and Road. In terms of uh, technology, in terms of consumer products, in terms of uh, electronics, each sector is very, very different. I think uh, just like how China goes out and makes investments abroad, they, have sen they send teams out to make a market study, market survey. And the same has to be done to consider investments or projects in China. Um, I think uh, as, as previous speakers have said, you know, there is a lot of misunderstanding and there's a lot of uh, difficulties in really appreciating each side, European side and the Chinese side because of this lack of understanding. Um, one thing which is very positive, I think, is at least from the Chinese side, um, young students are keen to learn about what's going on outside. They want to learn about Europe. They want to learn about the education system in Germany. They want to learn about the US, but I think it's not reciprocal. What is happening though, is increasingly the developing South, the global South is moving more and more toward China. Uh, as Confucius Institutes are being shut down in the US and parts of Europe, the first one has been opened in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf Cooperation Council countries as well. And plans are for Central Asia as well and also ASEAN countries. So I think, um, I think there is a need for more exchange, more understanding, uh, and in terms of the business cycle or the business circles, um, the thing to look at in China is number one, it's a massive market. Number two, it has great infrastructure. Uh, as a very senior German government official who was in Beijing two weeks ago, and I were talking about this, talking about mobile payment with Alipay and WeChat Pay, and he pulls out his wallet and it's all stacks of cash. He said, we're still on paper in Germany. And coming back to what the previous speakers have talked about in terms of maturity of the politicians, I, I'd just like to give a little anecdote. Watching TV one night with a bunch of friends my age, which is older folks uh, in China, they watch demonstrations in the US of people who refuse to wear masks or to be vaccinated. And the slogan is, it's my freedom of choice. And this is where my Chinese old friends started asking me, you know US, you lived there for 30 years. How can they say this? That means their freedom to not wear a mask means their freedom to spread the germs to other people. How can they be so extreme? This is something that I think is what is being referred to by both speakers before. Democracy does not mean freedom without responsibility, without responsibility to the rest of society, to other people in the country. But unfortunately in the US, the extreme versions of freedom like to carry guns around, to spread guns all over the place and drugs is now the prevalent role. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let me bring up a question to Ms. Zettler-Rouche about the BRICS, the role of the BRICS in bringing about a peace. I mean, we know the role that Brazil plays and also China with the peace plan. But the question comes from Thomas Böver. Um, he thinks it is in the hands of BRICS to end the war in Europe. Uh, this is because if BRICS countries uh, stop providing certain products or stop building certain infrastructure projects, then the West will be basically disfunct or will will have problems to produce grenades and, and, and other weapons. So he is basically convinced that the BRICS are very key for bringing about the peace, uh, which is badly needed to build the Belt and Road Initiative. What is your comment? Uh, you have to unmute, Helga. Oh. Okay, now. Um, the big question, obviously, is, you know, how do we get into the new paradigm? I mean, there, there is no question in my mind that the old paradigm, the idea of having a unipolar world, you know, dominated by one country or a group of countries and that the majority of the world remains um, in a colonial condition, that is over. There is no way how we will maintain this system or go back to it. And, you know, the question is, you know, can we in time, um, you know, get the transformation peacefully that, you know, we reach a situation where we have a new world order, a new a system, you know, where all countries learn to live peacefully together on the basis of the UN Charter, the five principles of peaceful coexistence, you know, models which which could work. And, you know, I, I think that that is, in my view, the big challenge, which is why, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of steps have to be taken. I, I think one idea which was mentioned earlier, that a lot of people should travel to China. Uh, my experience is that whoever has been there, or has done business there, or who is married with a Chinese, or has some other way of knowing about China, they are completely different, and they have a completely different view to go to China and see all the different cultural uh, treasures, you know, from 5,000 years of history, which the Chinese government has done an enormous effort to uh, renovate and to, you know, make accessible in a digital form. For example, you know, they have now the grottas of Dunhuang um, digital, digitalized and, and uh, you know, you, you can spread it to many people. Uh, there are many, many things which are totally exciting. That's one thing. <clears throat> then I think that the uh, question of can we as a human species, in where many people are afraid that the crisis in Ukraine could es escalate to World War III, or that the idea of global NATO could bring a Ukraine type of crisis to Asia could also lead to World War III. But are we not the, the intelligent species who should be able to find forms of self-governing that we are not leading to our self-destruction, which would be the case if we had a global war with nuclear weapons. So I think that one other thing which I think is very urgent is that we find ways to put the idea of a new international security and development architecture on the table. Um, I have written 10 principles for that, which I would like many people to look at and, and discuss. It's a comprehensive approach, how to organize such a new order. President Xi Jinping has come from another way. He proposed the Global Security Initiative, the Global Development Initiative, and you know a little bit later, the Global Civilizational Initiative, which together as a package, basically is the same idea, how we get to a new order of affairs and i think this is very urgent that you know we engage universities think tanks um, other organizations into that kind of a discussion in order to influence how we organize our future we cannot sit there and say the present politics is wrong 
it's dangerous, it's uh, crazy, but we have to actually mobilize uh, you know, institutions and universities, think tanks, and other gremiums to, to contribute to the idea of how can we rationally form a form of co cooperation on this planet, you know, which brings us successfully to a completely new time, a new, you know, like the modern times was completely separate from the Middle Ages. And I think that kind of an epochal change is happening in front of our eyes. But, you know, we have to have a more active idea of how to make sure that we are indeed the immortal species and not blow ourselves up. Thank you. Um, we are going now into the two hours of our uh, forum's time. Uh, of course, this is only the first stepping stone, uh, but I would like to give the three panelists the opportunity to um, give final remarks, wrap things up, and I would like to have it in the order of Ole Döring, Charles Liu, and Helga Zepler-Rouge. Oh, thank you very much. I would like to just to refer to the previous points of education and um, start with a um, personal anecdote. Here I'm, I'm teaching uh, among uh, the English uh, majors uh, in my school here. I'm teaching the new German department. We have about 50 students there now, uh, started three years ago. And I have done a class just finished the day before yesterday on German philosophy, introduction into German philosophy taught in English. And I read with my class in German, I read Kant's um, a treatise on, on enlightenment. And um, when, I, when I ask at the end of, of, of the term, when I ask them back, what, what was the, what were the, the, the take home lessons, the take, the take home uh, things that they can, can um, really say, well, this is something new I learned here. Uh, then that was that freedom does not mean volatility or just willfulness. Freedom means responsibility. And I think this, this anecdotal experience is not just anecdotal. I think this tells us a lot, not just about how great Kant was, <laughs> but how important it is now to rethink education, not only on the level of universities, but very early. There have been programs by the United Nations, by UNESCO, and I've been using the materials uh, that uh, try to, to, well, build a curriculum for, for uh, citizens of the world in a global democratic culture. This kind of democracy concept was inclusive and uh, uh, actually invites the, the, the different kinds of um, um, your democratic cultures. And I'm afraid that this program has somehow not been continued. Um, the publication I used was 1998. Um, uh, and um, I think we, we should really take this very serious and think about general education standards that allow us to make best use of the existing knowledge about how we can think in the best possible way so that we actually are not just under the impression that we are special species, but that we make use of this potential and actually honor and credit it by our work to become uh, what, what Kant says, there, there, there is no human being without education. I think this is very important and uh, this would be a very, very ambitious project for the United Nations. And I think that a very decisive contribution politically could come from China's initiative if Chinese uh, delegates were to take this up and say, well, we need to combine, just let me give you a headline, Kant and Confucius as pedagogues, and let's see what kind of curriculum we would come up with for democratic citizens of the world. That would be an idea that might have some long reaching consequences and could be feasible in terms of a roadmap. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to brainstorm in this sense with you and maybe we can stay in touch and continue this later. Thank you very of much. Course. Thank you very much. Charles Liu, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure being here for the first time. 
I would just want to get back to what Helga said before about social disorder. If there is decoupling, if there is a breakup of the efficient supply chain, which has been built with globalization, there will be social disorder, not only in Europe, but also in the rest of the world. Because this enhancement of people's life, life and livelihood from efficiency building, from cheaper and easier made products through the supply chain, uh, if this is broken, it will lead to the downgrading of the life, life living standards of not only people in Europe, but also US, of course, but also the rest of the world. And there could be social disorder. So even without World War III, we could see a lot of social disorder leading to internal strife in many, many countries. So the ramifications of this attempt at decoupling or sanctioning of China or putting Chinese companies and technologies on blacklists and increasing custom duties to the point where even in Europe now is now talking about anti-dumping duties on solar panels, which is supposed to be good for the world. It's, this political correctness is getting ridiculous. It's reaching a point where breaking up efficiency, going for disefficiency and going therefore to lowering the living standards of people all over the world, causing social disorder. So without World War III, we can have a lot of mess all over the world as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just getting a message that a lot of people are very thankful for the today's proceedings. And I would like to give Helga zeppler the word for her wrap up remarks and take the opportunity to, um, yeah, wrap up this forum for today. Well, let me thank all the other speakers for this uh, very useful discussion. And, you know, depending what the response is, maybe we should have a continuation of it because I think that the question of not having de-risking or decoupling or any of these things is really, really very crucial. So I think, you know, if other people, other scholars, other, you know, professors, industrialists, investors would like to join this as a, as a more or less continuous forum, I think that may be an idea which we could explore. So we could have like a a monthly dialogue or whatever form we could find. Because I think we need to have more discussion about it. And I think, you know, the cultural element is also very important. I mean, there are many economic reasons uh, for the world economy not to, de to, to decouple. And it would be catastrophic if you had the so-called North decouple from the global South at this moment of hope you know, where we could really have a new era of, of mankind. And I think to accomplish that, to have a better knowledge about the culture of the other civilization or nation is really important. And, you know, I have advertised for a long time that the aesthetic education method of Confucius and of Friedrich Schiller are extremely uh, similar. Uh, I actually wrote a speech about, uh, made a speech about it. And I wrote an article about it. Uh, and, you know, I think that the question of the image of man, which Confucius has, you know, which is the Schunze, and I'm for sure I'm pronouncing it to totally wrong. It means the sage, you know, the idea that man has to develop his full potential and the beautiful soul of Schiller uh, these are ideals which I think are extremely precious. And I have been convinced for a very long time that the only way how mankind can somehow learn to live together is that each nation brings forward the best tradition and then communicates to the best tradition of the other nation and the other civilization. So I think, you know, people in Europe and the United States just know much too little about the great Chinese culture. 
And I have found that the Chinese people are much more interested in European culture. If you look at orchestras, for example, you have a lot of young Chinese who are in love with Beethoven, who are studying classical music. And, you know, I think we need to really work on this question of the dialogue of cultures uh, as well. So I thank you very much for your attention. And, you know, I hope to see you sometime soon in whatever form. Thank you very much. So thank you for the wisdom of the speakers. Thank you for the participants and the very challenging questions. I hereby close the forum. Uh, I think in Chinese you say, and uh, would like to uh, wish everyone in the Western Hemisphere a good day or afternoon, good evening in Europe, and uh, good night, Wan'an, in China. See you next time.